A hunter told me this story when I was younger, about 16 years ago. He was raccoon hunting in the mountains around Blair, Wyoming, around 11 p.m., a new moon night, so no natural lighting. As typical for raccoon hunters, he had three hunting dogs, each with a locator collar, for in an event the dogs trailed off and didn't return to the hunter. Also, the use of flashlights are limited while hunting at dark, only use white when needed. If that, green or red lens is recommended. As the dogs caught a scent, they took off through the mountain. The hunter listening for his dogs to do what they're trained to do. Tree a raccoon and bark and howl to let the hunter know they got one treed. But this night was different. He didn't hear his dogs. He instead heard this loud screamer screech, deep sound, that neither resembled a human or animal. He noped out of the mountains thinking he'll return during the light to get the dogs, being careful not to run and make too much noise, as wild animals love chasing. About an hour of hiking back to his truck, he found his dogs hiding under his truck, shivering, something that trained hunting dogs don't do. His dogs specifically, they obviously ran back to the truck, no sign of being chased back to. The hunter swears it wasn't a mountain lion or any other wild animal he knows of, as he has had run-ins with mountain lions and about every kind the Wyoming mountains has to offer. He said he has never felt so cold and scared in his life from those sounds he heard that night. He has yet to hunt on that mountain since the 16 years ago. I'd always been an avid hiker, and that weekend I convinced a few friends to join me for a thrilling adventure deep into the woods. We had heard about a remote trail that promised stunning scenery and a sense of isolation, far from the typical crowds. It sounded perfect for a day of bonding and exploration. The weather was pleasant as we set off on our hiking trip. The trail was beautiful, winding its way through a dense forest. The leaves rustled underfoot as we made our way deeper into the woods. We chatted, laughed, and marveled at the tranquility that enveloped us. It was the perfect escape from the hustle and bustle of our everyday lives. As the day went on, we ventured further into the woods, following a path that seemed less traveled. The trees grew taller and denser, casting long shadows that danced around us. It was at this point that we began to feel a sense of unease, though we couldn't quite pinpoint the source of our discomfort. The trail led us to a small clearing, and that's when I saw them, a bunch of hanging dolls suspended from the trees. They were old, weathered, and eerie. Each one had a disheveled appearance with their lifeless eyes staring vacantly into the distance. The dolls hung from strings that swayed gently in the breeze, creating an unsettling symphony of creaking. My heart raced and a chill ran down my spine as I took in the surreal sight. I turned to my friends, who had also noticed the dolls, and their faces mirrored my own mixture of shock and fear. None of us spoke as we were all struck by the eerie atmosphere that surrounded us. The dolls were in the middle of nowhere, hanging there without any apparent reason. There was no one else around, and the silence of the forest was almost deafening. My friends and I exchanged nervous glances, and it became clear that we needed to get out of there, and fast. Without a word, we turned and ran back the way we came, adrenaline surging through our veins. The dolls seemed to watch us as we fled, their twisted smiles haunting my thoughts. We didn't stop until we were back on the main trail, far from the unsettling clearing. While I was casually hiking in deep woods, I didn't see a thing. I had headphones on. Darkness surrounded me as I followed a trail through the woods, which was the shortest way. I'm six foot four, and I have a silent step, so the raccoons throwing a party in front of me were as surprised by me as I was by them. Instead of scattering through the bushes, they made some room for me, squeaked and barked silently until I passed. 
ignoring me as if I were the intruder. It was light. A game of poker, I tell you. On the same walk, I came across an owl swinging itself from a tree, picking the remains of a mouse and leaving no trace behind. Still outside, well before I would reach the bottom of my steps, there was an abandoned building along the trail. I would usually find my way inside, but this time it felt really wrong, like someone was watching me for sure. So I stepped back and continued on my path. I didn't wear my headphones for about half an hour, so I was more attuned to the sounds of the wildlife. Oddly enough, I heard footsteps behind me about 200 meters away. It was fall, so the rustling leaves and branches certainly helped indicate what I felt. As I looked back, I saw two guys turning around. I strayed off into the bushes and waited for them to pass. When they did, they looked really sweaty, dirty, and hunched up in their sweaters, like they had just seen something tragic. I was filled with dread and prepared for anything, but they passed by without even noticing me. I continued on my path to finally reach my destination and practice some drums. A few days later, I learned that someone had taken their own life in the abandoned house, and those guys were the friends who were with them. At least that's the way the story played out. Very weird. Let me lay some cards on the table with a stupid question. Is anyone here familiar with the Sasquatch? Whether you believe or not, numerous people all over the world have claimed to have seen these creatures or similar creatures big hairy humanoids living out in the woods and or or mountains just about every continent has its own variation or myth of these things i became a researcher or at least reading up on others research on account of the increase of sightings in my county or region it started about a month ago when our local rangers noticed a significant decrease in the deer and elk population and an increase of their half-eaten bodies cluttering the region. Naturally, we assumed it was bears, but if you're reading this right now, you can probably guess that it wasn't the case. Rangers and hunting parties started to plan a culling or hunt to deal with what we thought was at least one super-aggressive bear. Normally, they wouldn't let mere hunters on the reserve, but in this case, several farmers found these carcasses on their fields. One was found in a barnyard. In retrospect, we should have noted that among the animal carcasses found, all of them had their faces eaten. We didn't think much of it. The local suspicions of a bear was seemingly confirmed when the four-year-old son of one of our local farmers spotted what he called the bear man climbing over a fence in his family's field. The man part we naturally dismissed writing it off as the over-imaginative exaggerations of a child. As part of the hunting expedition, many have set up trail cams along the borders of the forests and fields, hoping to pinpoint the animal, or should we say animals. There were different sightings taking place at different locations at or around the same time. And despite our first glances, these animals were not bears. They had the face, hair, and bill you expect to see on a bear, but their actual body was humanoid in shape when they stood upright. You can tell when it's a bear walking on its hind legs, and what the camera caught was a clear human-like limb structure. As you can imagine, there was a bit of a spectacle when these trail cam images were leaked to the town. At first, rangers only let the farmers and hunters know, but one of the farmers wanted some attention, so they tried to leak it to the media. Pretty soon, the town was up in arms about it. Some citizens were ecstatic, others afraid, others skeptical that Bigfoot has made this region home. Some wanted the hunting to cease, maybe to capitalize on the Sasquatch sightings that had been pouring in. The less enthusiastic and more rational insisted that the hunting continue, rationalizing that these were. In fact, bears and that camera tricks and perception issues were involved. Others thought the whistleblower must have photoshopped the images to play a tension hog, and the rangers insisted that these were mere bears, and it was voted up that they needed to be culled or driven away for the townspeople's safety. 
Before the following, there hasn't been any confirmed aggressive behavior from these things. One weekend, a family made their stay at their vacation home, a cabin from their usual lives in the city. They came by every year during the summer and certain holidays, other special occasions, to revisit their family living in the area. Not one day into their vacation, the mother took her two young children for a walk on a trail. She was warned to stay on the trail so as to avoid hunters, and it wasn't long before her little girl pointed and got her mother to look at the monkey people that have been following them. It was two, and the mother insisted they keep their distance from this wild family. The little girl began yelling and waving at the animals, who were staring at them from several dozen yards away. Eventually, one started advancing towards them, huffing and puffing and growling at them, and the mother hastily took her children back to the cabin. They left the next day, which is a good thing, because the day after they left, their cabin was ransacked, once again blamed on by bears. Unfortunately, that was the more passive of incidents. You'd probably roll your eyes when you hear the story of a kid waking up his parents in the middle of the night crying about some kind of man with no face in the trees outside his window. I rolled my eyes, too, before I read the rest of the report, but what the report says is no laughing matter. There was, in fact, a man's dead body hanging in the trees in front of the child's window, and said face was chewed off. The body was identified as a local shopkeeper whose family lived just on the outskirts of town. He wasn't labeled missing, but his sister, whom he lived with, mentioned how he hasn't come home the night before, and she wanted to wait until morning before she pestered the police about it. Her brother's car was found shortly after pulled off the side of a road in a forested area on a highway, not a quarter mile away from their home. It was here we decided that this animal, or animals as it were, is in fact a danger to humans. They had to be hunted, and they had to be killed. But that was easier said than done. You count how many times someone tried to hunt what they've said was Bigfoot. How many have been a success? These things have had to evaded hunters for centuries, and it's not like it was going to stop that night. What they did find was what they thought was an oddly placed beaver dam, placed in the deepest parts of the woods where hikers, rangers, and hunter alike generally don't go. There was a pungent smell in the air, and when they investigated the oddity of mud and logs, there were at least 17 bodies, human and animal alike. All of them were half-eaten, but the constant being that the beasts that have been eating them have a special affinity for their faces. Only four bodies have been identified, missing persons from seven months back. The rest couldn't be accounted for, but there have been a series of missing persons in the outer forests that extend well beyond the county's borders. None of the creatures have been found, but we did find a series of large human-like footprints leading away from the territory and towards the town. That had in dozens more of these dams, and upon further investigation, we could infer that these were not homes to these creatures, but more or less fridges to store their meals. Now comes the part where I give you a little folklore lesson. My research as you may or may not know, with all these Sasquatch sighting recorded, some descriptions may vary. For the most part, people claim to see what one would call a standard Bigfoot, just a big humanoid man-like ape. But there are others that Sasquatch research categorizes as types. Once in a while, people claim to see what they describe as looking more bear-like than man. The common name among Sasquatch enthusiasts of this type is the Gugway a name that derives from the name Kukwis. It is often described in comparison to the Wendigo, which should give you an idea what kind of animal we are dealing with. First Nations told legends of these with the description of man eating ogre-like creatures. Not exactly the cute, cuddly, or friendly Bigfoot you see in cartoons or media, right? Well, as a matter of fact, these things are described as being separated from what most people would call Sasquatch. They are closer to being bear-like than ape-like. Among the names the natives had for them was the Face Eater, and of course due to their appearance and facial structure, the Bear Men. When people describe the Sasquatch, specifically their heads and faces, you get something closer to a human, 
gorilla or chimp-like face. The gugui has a snout, according to witnesses, to be more akin to baboon or mandrel. Some sightings have mistaken them for werewolves or dogmen. Besides appearances, these beings were different from what was considered a normal. Bigfoot. When they describe Sasquatches, they describe creatures that are rarely hostile, mostly docile, omnivores that generally keep to themselves from humans, albeit they are still territorial. These things were famous for their affinity of eating flesh, violent temperament, and will actively hunt humans. And like the Sasquatch sightings, now these things have increased in recent years, with most people passing them off as one and the same. In the farther north of the America, or Canadian, or Alaskan regions, there are legends there too. There they are referred to as the Genosqua, and again, often overlap with the myth of the Wendigo. They describe how these things are nocturnal, how they live underground, how they were not only cunning hunters, but fishing survivors. They got the nickname the Stone Giants by adorning their fur with mud and rocks, forming makeshift armor on them. My further research from a number of sources tells me that while they are more often than not solitary hunters, they do operate as family groups and rarely, if ever, hunt together. How they function is hardly any more pleasant than what is previously described. Some of my sources tell of how these creatures practice cannibalism to their dead or when they are unsuccessful in their hunting. Incest in their own groups. How in colder weather they wear the hide of their kills and some even describe how they have a tribe-like mentality. This begs the question of just how intelligent they really are. One could almost call them evil insofar as you can call a species of animal evil conclusions and concerns. Which brings us back to here. As with the rise of Sasquatch sightings around the world, there has also been a rise of sightings of the Gugwi or Janosqua, and I have more than enough of reason to believe that we are getting a special rise of these creatures in my hometown. Four days ago, schools were closed because large dark shapes could be seen walking or standing near the forested areas just off the school grounds, separated only by a small field and a chain-linked fence. When the kids left the schools, there were four of them walking, standing by, and watching the elementary school, and have been specifically observing the buses before disappearing back into the trees. One of the local farming families left town in a hurry last weekend when a dog ran into a barn to confront an intruder. The dog never went out, and when the farmer investigated, he almost immediately ran out, got his family into the car, and fled their property without so much as a word to the confused neighbors. Days later, said neighbors, notices a thick, pungent smell, muskier than anything that usually comes out of a barn. It was as if it was stuffed with dead and decaying bodies. The dog's remains were later found just off one of the neighbor's property, when the animals on his own farm started acting up on a disturbance. All that remained of the dog was a spine, ribs, and mandible. Two days ago, a gas station just out of town was raided and ransacked. All its snacks were half-eaten and discarded. The attendant said he hid in a garage when he saw six Sasquatch walking onto the scene while he was about to close up. He described them as carrying the remains of a cat and a raccoon. Obviously, it was not enough to satisfy their hunger, and the food at the gas station obviously wasn't helping. The only snacks that were not thrown away was the meat products, the jerky and the hot dogs, but that was about it. One became frustrated, and they attacked the smallest in their group and dragged its remains away. The attendant should count himself lucky that the smell of gasoline and motor oil must have covered his scent. Around the same time that very night, a couple who lived just outside of town awoke to the sight of two of them scavenging their garbage when one of the creatures noticed the couple through the window. As these animals began to pound on the doors and windows, the residents had to make a daring attempt out the back door. They had to lure the beast back after them and run around the other side of the house to their jeep and drive to the police station. Getting the police to believe them wasn't a problem considering the increase of sightings, but by the time they got there, the creatures were nowhere to be found. 
What they did find was what was left of the boyfriend's elderly mother, who was in the couple's care. In their panic, they must have forgotten her, as they have forgotten to close the back door. After these incidents, the town was afraid. Half of them wanted to leave this town for a safer place. It was decided that the hunts continue in order to deal with the threat at hand with the aid of the police and park rangers. Some idiots thought that it was best to leave them alone and for the town to continue to capitalize off the Bigfoot sightings. So the other night, about 60 hunters went into the woods, determined to put an end to the threat. There is 200 miles of unexplored forest in our parks and places that the previous hunting expeditions never reached. During that night, the forests were filled with howls, not matching the kind normally heard from wolves and coyotes and the occasional gunshot. As far as any success rate goes, only 28 hunters walked out of the woods the next morning, the rest unaccounted for. There has been no confirmed kills among these things, nor were the bodies found of the missing hunters. Around the same time, the town was being evacuated. Only a select few families stayed behind. Unfortunately, a few roads were blocked by large boulders and rocks, a classic calling card of a Sasquatch, their way of setting the borders of their territory. Who is to say the Gugwi or the Genoska or whatever you want to call them is any different in that regard? A few of the people blocked off noted dark shapes, observing them from the trees. Many are expecting these logs or boulders to be removed by the police in order to continue evacuation, but there's a few concerns that doing so could lead to a death trap with those things watching from the woods. Now we are considering calling in the National Guard for interference, but I have concerns of my own. It's not like they wouldn't have any reason not to believe us with the evidence we collected. Sure, they could help with the evacuation, maybe try to help in the extermination, but there lies the problem. I'm not military artillery expert, but if the stories of the genus play armor are true, and considering the apparent failures of the hunter's rifles, their ammo should fare better right. I guess it depends on what these creatures are coating their fur with, but whatever it is was able to stand the bullets of hunting rifles. The stone giants got their name for their armor and how it made them resilient. If those stories are true, the easiest solution is to start a fire, bring in explosives, etc. This would at best start forest fires, and at worst, turn our county into a war zone. And considering how bold these creatures are in sneaking near or into the town, I can't help but think of the worst case scenario. Such as once again taking into account the increase of Sasquatch sightings, I don't believe it to be a coincidence that these coincide with environmental changes. Deforestation, pollution, natural or man-made climate change, etc. Last year there was a chemical plant built for the next town, on the other side of the forest. Besides this requiring a small amount of deforestation, months before this whole mess started, there was a controversy of them dumping their waste in the unexplored regions of the woods, requiring more human interference to salvage what they can. But alas, the immediate environment was considered too polluted for any animal to survive off the land there. What is an animal to do when their environment is destroyed? Naturally, they migrate, search for a more hospitable environment, especially one with more food. And unfortunately, humans have always been on their menu. I believe that the increase of sightings in my county is a prelude of what's to come, considering that climate change isn't going to stop in the foreseeable future. And with more and more sightings of Sasquatch-like creatures, I fear the absolute worst-case scenario that cities will possibly be seen as a new food source. At the very least, my county may be the first of many incidents you want to know what's ironic? The only bears we've seen in this whole ordeal were among the animal carcasses found with their faces eaten. I was standing about ten feet down in the forest around a deep ravine, 
not really too far from the house, but it was right next to a patch of woods going further south into the national forest. The narrow patch of woods then stretched northward. Leaves were on the ground, and that was the first thing that caught my attention. The sound of something walking through the leaves. It was a measured, long tread, and I could tell. I started really looking around, trying to see what was making these sounds. I was much braver back then. Then, over on the other side of the ravine, close to the bottom but definitely walking uphill, I saw it for all of about three seconds. It seemed longer at the time, and it was about fifty to a hundred yards away. It was very large, and I could see that it was hairy. I could see the ground between its moving legs and some vague image of arms, but not the head. Some forest branches obscured my view of the very top part of the body. I could tell it was walking upright uphill, and it was not a bear. It was standing with a purpose on the hill on the other side, and it quickly went out of sight. Now, I know I wasn't thinking clearly because I decided to try to get a better look at it. So, I ran as quickly as I could around the rim of the ravine, starting from our original front yard, which is not the best playground, I can tell you. Anyway, it didn't take me long to reach the other side and move down into the woods slightly to look around and see if I could find it again. However, I did not see it again. I was there for only a minute or so when it suddenly occurred to me that it, I didn't hear anything anymore. No sounds, no birds, nothing. Fear like I had never known before hit me, and I went running, practically screaming back to the house. I told my mother what I'd seen, and she, of course, did not believe me. My mother, though, told me to never tell anyone else the story. For a long time, I didn't tell a soul except for family members, but of course they didn't believe me. It didn't help that only one or two people since then truly believed that I saw Bigfoot. Since then, I have had lots of trouble going out alone in the woods. While no one actually calls you a liar, they look skeptical, and you can tell they either think you've been drinking or drugging or saw a bear. I did not see anything, but I did hear a lot. While on a boat fishing with two friends, we were along the shoreline, joking around and trying to catch something when we heard a very large animal wrestling in the woods. The animal and object were not far from us, but we could not see them due to the dense vegetation and the low light conditions. The creature did sound very large, and the thrashing of the vegetation became louder. The three of us in the boat began to speculate about what we were hearing, and none of us were worried until we heard a shrill from this animal. It can only be described as very loud, bone-chilling, and it did indeed strike fear into all of us. We began to pull our lines and started the boat ASAP to leave the area. The animal began to run away from our location, and I think the direction was southeast. If I am correct, we could still hear the animal moving through the dense vegetation at a fast pace with no apparent problem. The animal continued to shrill on occasion, stopping approximately every 200 yards or so. The final shrill was heard approximately one quarter to half a mile away through dense woods and vegetation, up a hill. The time frame in which this took place was so fast that we were unable to think of an animal that could sound so large, have such a deep shrill, and move so fast. The shrill was unlike any other animal I've ever heard, and neither were the two other people I was with. The shrill was later heard by me approximately two years later while I was on my way home from work. I was listening to Art Bell, and Bigfoot was the topic. Somebody had an audio of a Bigfoot, and when the audio was played, I again became afraid, speechless, and the hair on my neck stood up, and my eyes teared up. I was with my friends. We were all in the car, sitting waiting for another person to text us and tell us to head to their house. It was like 10 p.m., so dark but not too late, and all the windows are down and we hear this short monotone whistle noise, like somebody calling a dog, 
It wasn't too high-pitched and not lasting more than a couple seconds. Then, twenty seconds later, it happened again, almost the same, but different enough it couldn't have been a machine. Kept happening every twenty, thirty seconds. Everybody was terrified, but my superstitious friend said, Don't acknowledge it, and we carried on our conversation, and it seemed to go away, but not for a few minutes. It was eerie. I don't think it was a human calling a dog or something like that, because there didn't seem to be any urgency but sort of sounded like it was communicating to something, and it sounded maybe human. Not a bug or a coyote. I live in the PNW, by the way. Last note, all of us heard it, and it freaked all of us out. Like maybe it was just a really creepy bird, but it felt like it was talking to or trying to find something, and it was just one of those feelings that make your hair stand up. We weren't even way in the boonies, just in a pretty rural area, just outside town with lots of forest and not a lot of houses. My sister lives in an apartment complex and has been experiencing some wild things to say the least. It's to the point she has moved into an Airbnb till she can sublet a different place at the end of the semester. For context, a girl was murdered in her building in 2019. Read Ashley Stewart College Station for info. Ashley, the girl, was murdered by her ex-boyfriend after her roommates left for a dance practice. They were watching movies together and they left, and upon returning, found Ashley had been stabbed multiple times. The whole semester, she has been calling home, in tears, telling us what's going on. She has had her hair pulled, things thrown at her. Our mom was on FaceTime with her when a salt shaker flew out of the cabinet and hit her in the head. TVs turning on, deadbolts locking other roommates out, eat, etc. She can't sleep and is nauseous all the time when she is home. But when she leaves her apartment, she feels fine. This past weekend was the last straw. On Friday, one of her roommates had a boy over, and after telling him the situation, he was dismissive and joked, saying, Okay, if you're really here, give us a movie to watch. In response, the TV turns on the movie Get Out. After a few seconds, the TV switches to a second film. No one gets out alive, I know. I feel like it sounds ridiculous. On Saturday, my sister was studying in her bedroom and comes out to her roommates, freaking out. They were watching a movie on Netflix, and the screen switches to a new profile for Ashley, spelled correctly. It then opens the search bar within the profile and starts typing note. The text is being input at about the speed you could type on a keyboard, but faster than being typed using a rock remote. Jennifer don't leave me. Jennifer is one of her roommates, and by coincidence or not, works at a local hospital and is friends with a girl who knew Ashley. Part of me feels like she, Ashley, is protective in a way. Dead, bolting the door late at night, telling the random boy to get out. But those could, in a way, also be interpreted as malicious. My sister is literally sick and tired of the situation, and she has to move. But also, if it is Ashley and she is looking for help, my sister's heart hurts for her. On to the apartment complex. They are insistent that my sister and her roommates are not in the apartment where Ashley was murdered. One of the roommates went to the office and asked, and they said they were not legally required to disclose that information, Texas state law. My parents are on their way to visit or help her get situated in the Airbnb. But does anyone have any thoughts or info? Any advice? Literally anything is appreciated. So I want to preface this by saying this is a true story, and the events I'm going to describe happened on a couple of different occasions. A friend and I had been driving home from shopping when she started to feel sick. Now it was nighttime at this point and dark, and we're on a rural, poorly lit highway, still about 45 minutes from home. But she had started to get really nauseous and asked if we could pull over, so I did. I pulled over at the nearest turnout, which happened to be next to a huge field with a small house in the distance. 
Now I'm shitting myself the second I pull over because I've seen enough horror movies to be paranoid about these kinds of places, but she bails out of the car and starts walking towards the field, heaving. I'm sitting there kind of looking around and keeping my eye on her when she asks me for a bag for the rest of the car ride home. I oblige and get out to the car, going to the trunk, and start to dump out one of the grocery bags. Now what's weird is there should have been a lot more noise. Yes, it's dark, and there aren't many passing cars, but there are no dogs barking, no crickets, nothing. I finish with a grocery bag, and I'm just standing at the trunk watching her. She's in front of the field. There's also a shallow ditch in front of her, full of water, which I remember being odd, Gus. It hadn't rained in a while. There was also an orchard to her left. I remember her looking down at the water, then yelling to me, Did you hear that? We need to go. Like now, we both bolt back to the car, lock the doors, and drive off. What she heard was a loud shriek, a cry and it was getting closer and closer to us. We had both felt something watching us, too, but never saw anything. A few nights later, completely different place, we were having a bonfire. It was me, her and her sister, outside by the bonfire. Now it's summer, and we're talking twelve, one o'clock. We were all having a good time, laughing, joking around, and listening to music and dancing when all of us Sudden, the vibe just kind of changed. We all got uneasy. My friend and her sister looked at each other, and we're like, um, do you feel that? And if we all got the sense we were being watched, we ran back to the house so fast. We talked about when we got there, how maybe it was the same thing she heard that night at the field. She was worried it had followed us home somehow. That's when she tells her sister about the sound she heard of Mike. Her sister's eyes got wide, and she begins to tell her about the other night. We, she also heard a noise like that. She said it was so loud it woke her and her dad up. She thought it was a baby crying and wailing or an animal and wrote it off. We're not really sure what it is or was. I just know that I've never felt that uneasy before. It was a scary feeling. She thought I wouldn't believe her when she began telling me, but I do. It's crazy and unexplainable. But I swear to God that there was something out there those nights. It can't be a coincidence either, can it? That two separate nights at completely different locations that they heard this thing. My friend was also worried because it seems that this thing keeps getting closer and closer. Let me know if you've had any encounters like this, or heard anything that you think sounds like what I've described. This happened in California in the mountains. I'm 17 years old, I know what you're thinking. It's just this kid's imagination. Just let me tell this story and you can decide if you think it's real or not. It was mid-December. To late December 2020 in central Pennsylvania, I honestly didn't think we had any skinwalkers here until now. Here's the story. I was at my family cabin hunting like most Pennsylvania do in December. I was going to be there for two weeks with my dad, brother, and grandfather. We arrived the first day at 4, 45 p.m., so we still had some hunting light left, so we grabbed our rifles and headed out. We got some light snow in the morning so we could see the tracks easier, but enough to get stuck or lost. We walked for roughly five minutes. When we finally came across some tracks, there were two sets and some scat we could tell by the size of the scat one was a buck. My brother and dad went after one set of tracks, and me the other. I followed the tracks always, till the brush was getting too thick for me to see past 30 yards, so I decided to sit up against a tree with my rifle. About 15 minutes later, I was eating a snack bar and drinking water when it sounded. Like I went deaf, no noise. The whole wood sounded quiet when I heard a loud church and pop of sticks and leaves. Sounded way too heavy to be a deer, but couldn't have been a bear since we didn't see many in the winter. The one way I knew something was right was the awful smell of meat that sat in the sun for two weeks. Five minutes later, everything was still very quiet when I suddenly got this feeling of being watched. 
Now, I, I don't get scared easily, but I got up, packed all my stuff up, grabbed my gun, and walked slowly looking behind me every few yards. When I finally got back to camp, it was five, fifty, four roughly, and it was dark. I saw my brother, dad, and grandfather sitting around the campfire eating hot dogs and beans. I pulled up a chair and gazerot and a hot dog and started to eat it when my dad asked, Did you see anything? I sat and thought for a minute, no nothing but snow and birds, thinking it was a good idea to hide what I smelt and heard. Later that night, when I laid down, I thought about it some more and texted a family friend. He was forty. Nine, maybe fifty, the smartest outdoorsman I knew, I texted him. Hey, so I had a weird experience in the woods today. He texted back what? Happened, son. I said this terrible smell like I've never smelled before. And these really big footsteps, way bigger than a deer, he said smell. What kind of smell? I said like someone left mead out in the sun for days, he texted. Oh, I was worried you would say that. Let me tell you a story. So I was 27 in 1999, and I was hunting deep in the backwoods. I was sitting there for some time when this smell overcame me, smelled like rotting flesh, and everything went silent. I couldn't see anything, but about 15 minutes later, I heard some say my name and say, come here. The only part was it was my mom's voice, clear as day. The thing is, she died two years ago. I ran and never looked back and never hunted there again. I dropped my phone from pure shock. I pulled my blankets up and went to be. I didn't want to move. I had a terrible nightmare of a deer that wasn't really a deer chasing me, and I feel, and right before he attacked me, I woke up sweating and screaming. Day 2 We went out for our second day of hunting, and I walked to a tree stand we put up that summer. I got in, and in about an hour or so later, everything went silent, and I heard the walking again, and the smell was back. The only difference this time is, I could see it. Raggy skin, almost like it didn't fit no tail skin on the face, was dropping way down below where it should be. I pulled up my gun, shaking like never before, looked down the scope, and shot it twice. It ran so fast into the bushes while screaming and crying like crazy. Five minutes later, my dad radioed me asking if I got one. I said, well, I shot something that looked like a deer. I don't know what it was. Please just get here as I drop my radio to the ground. My brother, dad, and grandfather all came with their guns. Fifteen minutes later, I was still in the tree stand shaking. They had to help me down from it. They asked me what I shot, and I said, I I think it was a doe, but... It was different. I told them what it was. They didn't believe me, which I don't blame them. It was crazy to think I barely believed myself. And the scariest patriot of it all happened. We all heard our mom's voices say our name and say, where are you? Yeah, that's right. We all heard our own mom say. The same thing my grandfather heard, who is my dad, his and my brother and I, ours. We all looked at each other and got out of there and... Then we heard a baby crying. We felt bad, but had to go. We knew it wasn't real. We got to the cabin, and while we were packing, we heard a thud. I opened the door with rifle in hand and saw two dead rabbits on the porch with their stomachs ripped out. We got out of there, ran to the truck rifles still in hand. We got in and drove fast as we could. That was the longest ride ever. We sold the property since none of us would go back. The new owners have had it for roughly a year, and now just started having problems. Should we tell them what happened to us? This happened to me, hello. My name is Arnold. I'm just about to turn 20 now, but I'll never forget what happened that day. I was at my grandparents' house. They were watching me for the day. They live out in a mixture of farmland and woods in rural Wisconsin. Their yard is mostly surrounded by farmland, but to the right side of the yard is a couple acres of woods and a swamp. It was a really hot, muggy morning in July. I was standing out on the deck, shooting at some cans with my BB gun. All of a sudden, I got the sense something was wrong. 
It felt like I was being watched. I started scanning the tree line, and down at the edge of the trees, about sixty yards away, by the swamp or woods, was this thing, standing, that I can only describe as a dogman. It was about seven feet tall, covered with shaggy gray hair, had the classic dogman face, long snout pointed ears on top of head, yellow eyes, and it was very muscular. It was standing on two legs, but it appeared to be sort of leaning up against a tree. We locked eyes, and while it was probably only ten seconds, it felt like hours. It sounds silly, but I felt the thing had a sinister grin on its face. It was extremely intimidating. I know that had that thing wanted to kill me, it easily could have done that. I could relive this encounter, at my age now, with a shotgun instead of a BB gun, and I'd still be just as terrified as I was then. It definitely had a very negative and sinister vibe to it. After locking eyes with the thing, it just bolted off on two legs through some of the swamp and emerged farther down the tree line and then ran off into the forest. At first, I thought it might have been one of my older cousins playing a joke on me who lived nearby, but then I realized there was no way they could be wearing a suit, be seven feet tall, and clear the swamp as fast as that thing did. I wasn't going to tell Grandma and Grandpa I saw a werewolf down by the swamp. They'd never believe me. So I just kept my mouth shut and tried to carry on with my day there. Well, later that afternoon, I was talking to my aunt, and she brought up the fact that she had heard strange noises the night before. When I asked what they sounded like, she said it was a lot of snarling and growling, and it kind of sounded like an animal being attacked. Maybe five years ago, one night I was at a friend's house out in the country in Vesper, Wisconsin, when my friend's car turned in and came rushing up the driveway. The car came to a halt, and two of my other friends jumped out. They explained that they had seen something they just couldn't describe. I asked them if they got a good look at whatever had them so shook up. They looked at each other and said yes. They said they were driving through the country on their way to join us and were driving past a farm when they noticed something in the ditch. The friend who was driving said he flashed his brights to get a better look, and whatever it was raised up and ran across the road on all fours. It looked like it could walk on two legs if it wanted to, they both said. They also said it looked like it was half dog, half man, or maybe half dog and half monkey. They couldn't explain how the creature looked any better than that. They just kept trying to compare it to other animals. They said they were about 20 yards from it. The brights were on, and they got a good look at it. Well, that's the story. I'll never forget how stricken their faces were with panic and fear. I don't think they were lying. Several years ago, I was a long-haul truck driver. In this instance, I was on I-40 in Newberry Springs, California. I'd probably been through this area 30 or 40 times, but it never really paid any attention to the name of the town. While traveling through the area, I noticed a woman standing in the desert dressed in bright white. It really caught me off guard because it was so out of place. I looked when I went by, and she appeared to be a Middle Eastern cheap clothing, but she appeared to be bright white. I couldn't really make out any facial features as well as her feet and hands appeared distorted, almost like she was levitating. I called my sister and told her about it immediately. I told her the name of the town and what I saw, so she got on Google to see if anything like that had been reported, but it hadn't. Thirty-six hours later, I pulled into a rest area in Dragoon, Arizona, to go to bed for the night. I was scrolling through Facebook, and an article caught my attention. It said something to the effect of a tractor, trailer car accident in Newberry Springs, California. Now, keep in mind, I never paid any attention to the name of that town before, so I clicked on the article to find out that right after I came through, there were a few cars and a tractor trailer that were involved in an accident. 
I think there ended up being about five fatalities in the accident. I immediately thought back to the woman I had seen standing in the desert. My thoughts. Maybe she was an angel waiting to usher these souls to the other side. Maybe she was something else, but the whole experience left me with more questions than answers. The day was ordinary, the sun casting a warm glow over the landscape as we embarked on a road trip, the hum of the engine and the promise of adventure in the air. My wife's granddad, a kind soul with a penchant for classic rock, was a massive fan of Queen. I had heard countless stories of his love for Freddie Mercury's powerful vocals and the band's timeless melodies, but there was one song in particular that held a special place in his heart an obscure gem that had eluded my musical radar until that fateful day. We set off with the windows down, the wind tousling our hair as we sang along to familiar tunes on the radio. My wife, lost in thought, periodically gazed out at the passing scenery, her eyes reflecting a mix of nostalgia and fond memories. Little did I know that the journey would take an unexpected turn weaving a tapestry of emotions that would forever be etched in our hearts. As we cruised along the open road, the radio played a seemingly random playlist of Queen's hits. Then, out of the blue, a melody I didn't recognize filled the car. It was a lesser-known song, a hidden treasure in the vast repertoire of Queen. My wife's eyes widened, and her expression transformed into a mixture of disbelief and recognition. The lyrics unfolded, and the music carried a certain weight, an inexplicable connection to her granddad's memory. Time seemed to stand still as the haunting melody enveloped us. The song, unfamiliar to me, seemed to resonate deeply with my wife. She listened in silence, her gaze fixed on a distant point as if transcending the confines of the car. The atmosphere shifted, becoming charged with an unspoken connection to something beyond the tangible. A mere sixty seconds later, just as the final notes of the song lingered in the air, the phone rang. My wife's mother's name flashed on the screen, and with a sense of foreboding, she answered the call. The news hit us like a tidal wave. Her granddad had just passed away. A profound silence settled over us as we absorbed the weight of the moment, the serendipity of the song's timing hanging in the air. In the years that followed, that lesser-known Queen song never graced the airwaves again. It became a poignant reminder of a moment suspended in time, a mysterious connection between the music and the departure of a beloved soul. The memory of that day lingers, and whenever we think back to the open road, the unfamiliar melody, and the bittersweet synchronicity, we are reminded of the extraordinary ways in which life weaves its intricate tales. I worked at a theme park run by a litigious mouse, so we'll leave it there. I was closing a hybrid meet and greeter theater costume shop by myself one night. It was already a creepy location. The backstage was kind of a graveyard for props and robotics that had been used in old shows but hadn't been discarded, including this giant, terrifying, magic mirror face taller than I am. The backstage lights were on a timer, so I was in kind of a rush to get out of there before they turned out, because one, dark, and two, I didn't much care for the creepy giant face in the shadows. Seriously, it's terrible. Its jaw hung slack. The timer, same kind you use on like a hot tub, was ticking down, and I locked up the cage we used for some of the costume pieces. I had ten minutes. All the lights went out except the safety blues, leaving me with a damned mirror. I ran because I hate that thing. Got into the green room nearby, fumbling for my keys. Find that those lights are out, too. Probably an outage, but I was done for the day. I just needed to close the door. My fingers just barely brushed it, and the whole thing slammed shut, locked, 
without me ever putting my key in it. I sprinted to Small World just to see some lights. Also, the stupid clock from the Cinderella Castle was tolling the whole time. It did that anyway, but it didn't help. I always have major deja vu, and it's not because I've seen certain things before. I've dreamt about them. For explain, when I first started dating my boyfriend, I had a dream that I was in his parents' house, sitting on their couch, talking to his mom while looking at their house plan. I hadn't met his mom yet, hadn't even been to his parents' house, and yet five months later I'm experiencing that same dream in real life. Everyone is wearing the same clothes. Everything in the room was the same, and, and we were even talking about the same thing. Whenever this happens, I get this powerful feeling all over my body, and I immediately know that I've had a dream about this way before it even happened. And there's been a lot of instances where I've dreamt about me being somewhere and in a situation, and a few months later it happened. I don't know what this is or if I'm some kind of psychic. I wish I was making this up because it honestly freaks me out sometimes. And everyone I've told about this thing, they look at me like I'm crazy. My boyfriend believes me because I've told him about a dream and then later it happens and he's like, I remember you telling me about that. If anyone knows what this is or has experienced it themselves multiple times over, please let me know because I feel like a crazy person. In the quiet expanse of northwest Oregon, where the hills roll and the trees whisper their ancient tales, a childhood memory unfolded on a vast property that cradled mysteries within its folds. My friend, a mere eight years old at the time, found himself in the enchanting landscape of his family's hillside property. It was the kind of place where the world seemed to stretch out endlessly, offering a playground for the imagination. The top part of the land perched high on the hill, held secrets only a child could uncover. On this particular morning, his mom had bid her goodbyes, leaving for work, her departure signaling the beginning of a day filled with youthful adventures. The sun bathed the landscape in a soft glow, casting a warm embrace on the sprawling acres of greenery. As any ordinary child would, he reveled in the freedom of the outdoors, exploring the wonders hidden in the nooks and crannies of the hillside. The day unfolded in a series of playful escapades, the laughter of a carefree heart mingling with the rustle of leaves and the occasional bird song. However, amidst the innocent joy, a curious incident disrupted the rhythm of childhood simplicity. As he stood atop the hill, his senses tuned into the natural symphony surrounding him. A voice echoed through the air. A voice so familiar, yet entirely out of place. His name, carried by the wind, seemed to beckon him. In confusion, knit his small brow. In the solitude of the hillside, he hesitated, searching for the source of the voice that shouldn't be there. It couldn't be his mom. She had just left for work. The timing defied reason, injecting a sense of wonder and a hint of unease into the idyllic scene. The echoes of his name lingered, and as he stood there, the realization dawned like the morning sun. The voice wasn't his mother's. An invisible thread of curiosity wove through his being as he pondered the unexplained calling from the hillside. Yet no matter how hard he strained his eyes and ears, there was no trace of another soul. Years have passed since that day on the hill, but the memory remains etched in the fabric of his childhood. A moment when the ordinary blurred with the extraordinary, the hillside property with its vastness and secrets became a backdrop for a tale that defied explanation. And as the whispers of the Oregon trees continued to weave their enigmatic stories, that childhood mystery lingered forever etched in the rolling hills and the curious heart of a little boy.
Okay, here we go. I've had a few unexplained experiences, but this one was about an angel. It was the summer of 2017. I was in a really bad time in my life and had recently broken up with my girlfriend. Another girlfriend had just passed on a few years before that. I was horribly depressed even at a gathering of friends at the night spot where we gathered on Thursdays. So I sat out front on the sidewalk and had like a comatose posturing deal going on, just crying and crying for like 30 minutes straight. Friends came and went to check up and stuff, but a totally weird thing happened after about 45 minutes of going over the past few years in my head. How horrible everything was. Out of nowhere, a lady touched me on my shoulder and said, Can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? My first thought was, please don't be another Christian who wants to pray for me. But I responded, to help me not mess up my life. So I was bitter and angry. Then things got weird. We kept talking, you know, and she's like, so I just got a feeling passing by. The West Oaks Mall, okay, Florida. And she said, I had the random urge to drive right up here into this parking lot and walk right up to you. Right? But then she starts talking about life and how she broke her rib and how she's learned so much about life through the injury. Then this lady says that she was divinely gifted and that the Creator was talking through her. I just didn't quite understand why I continued to talk to her, but I felt compelled to listen. So, eventually, she says, your name is Adam, right? Just like total eyebrow, look over the shoulder moment. I'm like, Oh, yeah. And I look around to see if my friends put her up to all this, but they were still inside. She continues saying, You are going to change this world. You are going to use your gifts and talents to bring true joy, progress, and change to this world. I kind of marvel at this statement, and she assures me again. It is not her speaking, but the Creator speaking through her. She mentioned a few other events in my life that I can't quite recall, but they were very personal things that she would have never known otherwise. I begged her for a human name, and she finally gave one. She said her name was Natalie. My heart and soul were broken open like a walnut by this experience, and I never saw her again. She did offer to buy me dinner, but I felt like I was in the presence of an angel or a higher force and couldn't lie, so I insisted on revealing I had just eaten before we met. It was indeed a spiritual experience. I am grateful for this angel rescuing me during a moment of absolute despair. Not long after my encounter with the angel, I met a wonderful girl who was quite in tune with a paranormal and unexplained phenomena. I truly believe that she was sent to me after my angel encounter. I will admit that after talking to the angel, I went home lay in bed and asked that I meet a wonderful woman whom I could learn to trust and love. It seems that my wishes were answered. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.